Okay, thank you, Mira, uh, for your kind, kind words, uh, dear friends and colleagues. Uh, as you know, and as the title of this next session indicates, the purpose of the next 60 minutes is to examine whether some virtues of sports arbitration could and also should be transported to commercial arbitration. Uh, the users are calling for fast, low-cost pr proceedings, and uh, these characteristics are found in, in sports arbitration. We have an honor, honor to hear Professor McLaren's views on this interesting subject. He is one of the most experienced sports arbitrators in the world, uh, serving as a CAS arbitrator in the Swiss-based Court of Arbitration for Sport, and uh, he is also involved in different panels uh, regarding sports such as tennis, golf, basketball, professional ice hockey, and Formula One racing. And uh, Richard also serves, serves as an arbitrator in commercial ICC, ICSID, and AAA cases. Welcome to Finland, Richard. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, I'd like to uh, thank the organizers for inviting me. My first visit to Helsinki, like uh, Catherine, and uh, also to Finland, of course. Um, and I think it's a great program, and I hope we can contribute to it. Thank you. So let's begin with an important topic uh, relating to sports arbitration, and that is obviously speed. Uh, in the Olympic Games, the arbitral panels are able to render awards in a couple of days, and the regular, regular CAS code gives the arbitrators three months from the receipt of the case file to render an award. Richard, in your experience, are sports arbitrations truly fast? In some cases, yes. Uh, let's just talk about the Olympic Games for a moment. Uh, there, uh, the arbitrations are organized within uh, 48 hours of the request for arbitration. And then uh, the decision, at least, perhaps not with reasons, within another 24 hours following the hearing and reasons within 48 hours. So that's very speedy. Um, in a different format, uh, the National Hockey League uh, salary arbitrations, which I used to do, uh, the cases come on on, on set dates and uh, the submissions are made in advance, the hearing takes a day and the decision has to be issued within 72 hours. And in some cases, there can be, the parties can be millions of dollars apart in terms of what the salary for the player ought to be. Um, those are two examples. I, uh, I'm also president of the Basketball Arbitration Tribunal. It's based here in Europe. Its, it's seat is in Switzerland. And there um, we have a process where there are uh, um, no hearings and uh, there's one round of written submissions. The process is driven by the arbitrator. And from start to finish, so request for arbitration to, through to a concluded award uh, takes on average, six months. There are cases, of course, that take longer. So that's a couple of examples of speed. There, there are um, more. Um, I also have the uh, uh, obligation to serve in the Tennis Integrity Unit as an anti-corruption hearing officer, and that's a growing problem in many sports, and particularly in tennis, corruption uh, uh, caused by the uh, gambling and gambling syndicates corrupting the players, and then the players corrupting each other. And uh, there, uh, there's, a, again, a rigorous time scale so that most of those cases from uh, application for arbitration through to completion are done in less than three months. Uh, so they are on generally speedy. Of course, there's always the exceptional example, which is longer. So these are the rules uh, and the timelines uh, in the rules. Uh, but are the arbitrators able to adhere uh, to the time limits or do they seek extensions? It's rare for the arbitrators to seek extensions, but counsel frequently do, and uh, arbitrators feel obliged to probably grant those extensions. So uh, that observing the time limits is in the control of counsel, and partly in the control of the arbitrators. Uh, for the most part, they, uh, we 
do stay within the time limits and uh, certainly in the speedy ones like the National Hockey League salary arbitration I was talking about and the Olympic Games, uh, you must because there's so many other ripple effects that follow on after that decision. It affects other things that are going on, so it has to be completed within the time frame. There's no extensions there. Uh, also in the Olympics, of course. The, the award has to be rendered really quickly. Right. I, I was actually referring to the Olympics when I said there are other events. I, oh, yeah. I remember in, in one case in Australia, I was, had the good fortune, as you've been at the Winter Games just recently, I was at the uh, Summer Olympic Games as an arbitrator in Sydney at one stage in a, a case. We were, it was about 2 o'clock in the morning. We were hearing it late at night, and there was a good possibility that we were going to make a decision which would have required uh, a, a particular athlete to be inserted in the competition the following morning starting at 9 a.m. And the entire schedule uh, for television broadcasting is scripted down to 15-second uh, uh, periods of time. And so we had to work, uh, wake up in the middle of the night, the people that uh, were in charge of Stadium Australia and, and the competitions that were going on that day and warn them that there might be a uh, reorganization of the timing of the event schedule. And they all had to start work on that as it turned out, our decision at about 4.30 or 5 in the morning was that uh, there wasn't, the athlete wasn't going to be inserted, so it was all for naught, but we had to plan on that. But that's an example of the reason you have to observe the time limits, because there's all sorts of ripple effects that follow uh, many of the decisions. And equally true in salary arbitration, because when one case is decided, then it influences how other players either continue their arbitrations or try and settle them, because they know the reasons. Uh, for why that one particular case was deci decided. So, uh, very important most of the time in sports to observe the time limits. Therefore, you don't get very many extensions the way you may do in commercial cases. Some people may say that the sports disputes are small, and that is the reason why, why the uh, disputes are, are so quick. How would you comment on that? Well, I think that view uh, starts with the proposition that frequently it's an international federation or a national governing body uh, versus a particular individual or perhaps a team uh, uh, is involved. So it looks like one large party, one small party, small case, it just affects those people. And to some extent that's correct. But there are also uh, very significant uh, cases and ones that take a considerable amount of uh, time. I was involved in the first instance, uh, which was a AAA American Arbitration Association proceeding involving Floyd Landis, who was the next winner after the seven winners, uh, seven uh, Tour de France uh, uh, wins of Armstrong, which later were taken away from him. And uh, Landis's case, just in the preliminary to uh, sort out all of the issues about discovery and production, because they were claiming that the French laboratory didn't have the right equipment, uh, wasn't the, uh, the software wasn't up to date, uh, and many other complaints. And so there was demands for when was the machinery bought, when was the last time it was checked, what's the utmost up-to-date uh, software that's being used, etc. We had a very complex uh, three-day hearing to determine all of that and enter into all sorts of confidentiality agreements. And then, as you might imagine, given the, the thrust of the case, the hearing itself went on for 10 days, uh, and expert after expert about all the different aspects of how the equipment operated and whether or not it was properly tuned for the test. Uh, at the end of that time, Landis lost his uh, case, first instance in front of me and, uh, and my colleagues, and then appealed to Cass, and he lost a second time, and uh, the rest is history. He obviously, he lost the, that result. So uh, that's not a small case when you're 13 to 14 days of hearings. Uh, recently, for the Court of Arbitration for Sport, I was involved in the Duty Chand case. Um, very complex, very uh, interesting, but difficult to understand scientifically, a case about uh, females who are hyperandrogenetic. And uh, they have a condition that's with which they're born where they have both uh, a male and female genitalia. And uh, the International Athletics Federation and the ISC have been trying to determine what to do about regulating this particular problem. And there we, while we only had a three-day hearing, we had extensive briefs and many experts uh, involved in that. And uh, the reason we could get it done in three days was because uh, of the tireless efforts and work of counsel that were representing the parties to be very efficient. And, uh, and also, um, 
the panel itself imposed a time limit, so each party had a certain amount of time to do everything, and we kept track of it, and you know, each time you, one side was up examining a witness or uh, other uh, matters, the time limit was being recorded and, and, and reduced so that there was equal distribution of time, but it had to be done in those three days. Um, that was an incredibly complex case, and there was another one of recent date where the U.S. Olympic team and the, uh, or committee rather, and the International Olympic Committee were in a dispute over a rule that the IOC had put in place that said that uh, uh, athletes who had, who had a doping infraction could not compete at the next Olympic Games. And the uh, U.S. Olympic Committee had several athletes in that category. We had a, a, a lengthy hearing, a complex issue that affected people across the world. Uh, people like uh, Dwayne Chambers from the UK, as a result of the ruling, uh, were able to compete at the upcoming Olympic Games afterwards. That would have been London 2012. Uh, so the, the stakes in many of these cases are much bigger than just a, a small arbitration. But the impression is that they're small because there's usually a major federation and often individuals like Duty Chand opposing that federation, but a case that affects female and female co competition across the world. So sports arbitration is quick, although the cases may be big. And uh, now the key question is, what makes this possible? So could you please give us some reasons uh, why, why this actually happens? Uh, well, I, I mentioned one already. I think uh, council uh, are usually very experienced, very cooperative, and uh, really council have the ability to put their foot on the brake and slow things down or on the accelerator and speed things up considerably. So I think the caliber of the uh, lawyers representing parties in sport arbitration are a very important part of what makes it possible to do it in a speedy fashion. Then, uh, typically, there's one round of briefs, and that's it. Now, um, we're starting to see some relaxation of that idea, but uh, it's, it's in the CAS rules, for example, it's in many other uh, rules, and that means you've got to get everything into that brief, all, including any witness, uh, either will, stay, will say statements or affidavits, uh, plus the exhibits that would go along with that so that uh, you don't have a second chance and there's no follow-up briefs. Uh, so that makes a big difference, um, I think. And um, If I interrupt you uh, and, yeah, uh, sure. and uh, make a follow-up question, you, you mentioned that you have experienced uh, sports law lawyers involved in the proceedings. Have you experienced problems if, if the councils are not specialized on sports law? Does it make make things more difficult? It definitely makes things more difficult. And uh, a, a problem that I experience more, and this occurs primarily with uh, the professional tennis work that I do with anti-corruption cases, uh, frequently the people who are uh, alleged to have committed corruption offenses, such as uh, betting on their own game or um, agreeing to uh, throw a particular game or set within the overall uh, 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 match, um, those individuals uh, often don't have very much money, which is part of why they are easily corruptible, and uh, they represent themselves. Uh, not something you ever see in commercial arbitration, uh, but uh, you see a lot in, uh, in the Canadian courts, and I'm sure in courts here in Finland and elsewhere, it's increasingly a reaction of people uh, wanting justice but can't afford uh, all of the expensive people that are in this room. And uh, so that, that is a difficult problem and, um, and it puts the arbitrator in a very difficult position of trying to make sure that the procedure is fair while not entering the fray as uh, supporting one side or the other and particularly the party that's unrepresented. Uh, now there, I think there's some solutions to that but uh, they haven't really emerged yet. Uh, not the least of which would be pro bono panels, uh, which could provide assistance to those sort of individuals. Uh, at the Olympic Games, they do have that, but um, in most other circumstances, there isn't any available body of, could I call them, legal aid assistance that uh, might be able to uh, help the self-representative person. <laughs>
Have you seen situations in, in which a party delays the proceedings in purpose? Sorry, ask that question again. That, uh, have you seen situations in, in which uh, the parties delay the proceedings in purpose? Ah, uh, yes. Um, well, of course that happens. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, delay is, is an advantage for one side or the other, and, and so they try and make sure that there is significant delay. And that's where it's important for the arbitrator, I think, to come in and play a role and not allow that to occur. However, arbitrators being uh, dependent on being appointed by the parties, uh, and if not, at least not uh, being uh, disruptive to the institution to whom they're uh, an arbitrator, um, they, they tend to uh, go along with that rather than be rigorous in enforcing uh, the procedural rules and, and, and running a, uh, uh, a demanding case and stopping that. But, at some points, the arbitrator is powerless to do it because usually the maneuvering goes on within the rules of whatever sporting rules are applied, uh, whether it's the cast code or the bat code or, or whatever. So uh, that, that's definitely a problem and the only way, uh, the arbitrator has to take control and remember that they're in charge and uh, apply the rules vigorously and uh, try and stop that to the extent they can. Uh, you mentioned that the councils are committed to the proceedings in sports arbitration, uh, what about the arbitrators? Do you find that the arbitrators in, in sports arbitration are more committed to, to the cases than, than on the commercial side? Oh, I, I, I think the commitment to the cases uh, is probably not, there's no distinctions there between commercial arbitrators and sports uh, arbitrators. Many of the sports arbitrators also are in the commercial world and commercial arbitrators as well, like myself. And I think it's also important to remember that uh, sports arbitration, uh, commercial arbitration gave birth to sports arbitration. Uh, they now may have grown up past the parent and have much more uh, diverse set of activities than uh, commercial arbitration. But the model, the original model was uh, commercial arbitration and uh, it's evolving quite a distance from that today. Uh, but it certainly started from commercial arbitration origins. We all know that uh, it's sometimes really hard to find hearing dates if, if a hearing is arranged in the first place. Um, in Formula One racing arbitrations, they have an interesting system. Could you please explain that? Sure. Uh, yeah, the, I've only come across this in, in terms of uh, motorsport, uh, the FIA. Um, and they handle uh, not only Formula One, but, uh, but all of motorsport uh, decisions. And what they do is they select the arbitration date. So the arbitration date is, let's say, the 25th of June. And they have a panel of arbitrators, and they, uh, they will go to the panel, and they will select, uh, let's assume it's a three-person panel. It can be five or it can be one. Uh, and they will select more than the three. Uh, and they won't tell the parties who the selections are uh, until the night before or the morning of the arbitration. And so what they've done is they've set the hearing date, then they find the arbitrators that are available for that particular hearing date. Now that's quite the reverse of the model that's uh, typical, which is to find uh, a mutually convenient date between counsel and the arbitrators, whether that's a sports case or a uh, commercial case, that's, that's the typical process. And uh, motorsport does it very differently, and, and I might add, quite effectively uh, doing that. And uh, in a, every other case, though, if you're asked by the court of arbitration for sport to arbitrate, you're asked if your availability. Uh, I know when I run the uh, through my company, McLaren Global Sports Solutions, I run um, the panel for a number of sports, including UFC, the Ultimate Fighting uh, Group. Uh, and uh, I always ask availability before I appoint. Uh, and if they're not very available, then I don't appoint that person uh, because I, I don't think arbitrators should impede the process once the parties have decided that they have a dispute that needs resolution. Um, but I think we've all encountered arbitrators who take on a case and then you find that they don't really have the time to do it and it gets pushed, the date for the hearing gets pushed and pushed and pushed way out uh, beyond where it should be. And, that, that does happen from time to time, but on the whole, it doesn't happen in the sports world. You mentioned also the number of submissions 
to be filed in sports arbitration. Uh, do you think that the number of briefs could be limited more often also in commercial arbitration? I do, uh, for sure. And uh, let me turn to the basketball arbitration tribunal. I'm the president of that tribunal. And uh, we have there uh, no hearings. Uh, and the process is driven by the arbitrators. Now, I say there's no hearings. It is possible for the parties to ask for one, and if the arbitrator and the president agree, there can be a hearing, but that doesn't happen more than once a year. We're handling about 175 cases a year. Uh, and so the, um, the speed of that process uh, is very much dependent on the arbitrators, and uh, it, it works quite effectively, I think. Um, uh, and it's arbitrator-driven, so uh, they ask the questions, the parties provide the information. The initial document is a request for arbitration, which will have the grounds and have the relative information, exhibits and, and other information. And uh, then there is uh, no hearing. Uh, and the information is obtained by the arbitrator asking questions by email principally. And, and not only is there no hearing, but there is a considerable number of decisions which are issued on the basis of no reasons. Uh, now, in those cases, there are reasons. The arbitrator goes through the same thinking process as if you were going to write it and put it uh, in a, a decision award. However, um, it's done in a memo format, so it's kept in the file, and I see it as the president. And if there was ever the, the, an appeal, which in our case, because the seat of arbitration is Geneva, uh, would be to the Swiss Federal Tribunal. Um, the, and if they asked for the reasons, we'd be able to produce the memo, but it's never made public. It's only available to the arbitrator and myself. Um, and so that really speeds up the, the process considerably. And the kind of disputes there are monetary ones uh, exclusively, but they can be of significant sums uh, because they relate not only to a player uh, being dismissed because they've perhaps been uh, misbehaving with respect to their coach. Uh, a very common problem with American basketball players who go to China to play in the professional leagues there, actually get paid more money than they, they do in the National Basketball League in the United States. Uh, but they bring with them the habit of speaking back to coaches and, and uh, being uh, intolerant of, uh, of what they're being told to do, which is acceptable at all in China. So they frequently get fired and then the claims come back for millions uh, in, in those cases, uh, depending on the salary, of course. So um, procedural arbitration, uh, speed with which these cases go on uh, depends uh, on the type of... Uh, sport you're dealing with and the rules that you set up. And I've just given a few examples of how they're different in sport. Uh, you mentioned that in basketball arbitration you don't have any hearings. In my experience, it, uh, a hearing is arranged in, in every commercial arbitration, even, is, even in, in the small ones. So what is your, your view on this? Should the arbitrators in commercial arbitration refuse to arrange a hearing if the parties have not uh, nominated any witnesses or experts to be to be examined? Well, uh, I think in those circumstances, uh, a commercial arbitration could do what sports arbitration does. They, uh, you don't have to have a hearing. You can do them on the papers. CAS often does cases on the papers. BAT always does them on the papers. Um, and um, I think more and more of that model could be used in other circumstances, but we don't see that happening very often. What about the institute then? Uh, can, can the institute actually make the proceedings faster? For example, the CAS takes care of the correspondence between, between the, the tribunal and, and the parties and is also able to assist in research on, on CAS case law. Right, and uh, that, that's an interesting example. The CAS uh, have a number of counsel and whenever a CAS panel is set up, whether it's three or one arbitrator, uh, a particular counsel is assigned and, and that counsel handles the correspondence and uh, handles the procedural application of the rules under the instruction of either the president or the sole arbitrator. Um, so they're not doing it on their own. Um, and they, in the deliberations after the hearings, they have a voice. Um, it's not a binding voice in the way that it would be with the arbitrators. 
uh, and they do do research, which may be beyond what has been presented by the parties in the uh, material before the arbitration procedure. Uh, and I find that helpful, useful from time to time. Uh, but th where it becomes more of a problem is uh, when you add to that three-person panel, let's say, plus a cast counsel, and then you have a clerk as well, and then the clerk starts to write the decision uh, or portions thereof, and uh, then uh, do we have a fourth arbitrator? Do we have five arbitrators, but they're only three officially appointed? Uh, and sometimes counsel, uh, cast counsel, uh, internal counsel, uh, and I find this also in some of the uh, work I've done with the uh, ICSID uh, and uh, ICC. They feel that uh, they have more responsibility to the institution sometimes than they perhaps do to the particular panel, depending on what the issue is. So um, that causes me some concern in, in the commercial world, but they, we have the same concern in the sports world. I, I think that's no different, really, between one and the other. The trend in the CAS, at least, is to appoint a sole arbitrator instead of a three-member panel. Uh, would you prefer, when you appoint arbitrators to your, your arbitrations, would you prefer one or three? As an arbitrator, I think I am indifferent, uh, whether I'm a party appointed or a president or a sole arbitrator. Um, which is better? Uh, I, I think First of all, the parties want to have input into the arbitration uh, process. And by being able to nominate, even from a closed list, a particular person, they have some input. Uh, and so each side does that, and then the institution itself, uh, the head of the CAS Appeals Division or Ordinary Division, there are two divisions of uh, types of cases. One ordinary are essentially contractual. Uh, by agreement of, uh, to arbitrate, as opposed to the appeals which are done by, uh, also contractual, but the uh, uh, arbitration clauses in the International Federation or whatever bodies involved uh, uh, rules and also in the Athletes Agreement. Uh, those uh, type of situations. Uh, the uh, sole arbitrator uh, can handle the case, uh, but the parties lose the ability to put, have input into uh, who should be the arbitrators, even though it's a closed list. Um, but I also think it's very important, if you have a three-person panel, that the arbitrators who are party-nominated, uh, and this is, you actually have to provide um, uh, an affidavit to the uh, Court of Arbitration for Sport that you are independent and that you will remain so, and that you are acting as a neutral third-party arbitrator so that there are three independent decision-makers, not one being the president and the other uh, being really second advocates of the party's positions. Uh, and on the whole, that works well. You certainly see some times when that's not the occasion, but... Uh, uh, and sole arbitrating, of course, makes it much less expensive. I think that's a good part of the uh, reason for doing so. Uh, but when you go back to those complex cases, like that, the Floyd Landis case that I was talking about with 14 days of hearings, having three minds look at what has been presented and thinking about it, particularly when it's a complex scientific case or the Duty Chan case, which was extremely uh, difficult to understand and took me many, many days of preparation to understand the science, uh, three minds are better than one, and I think you get a better decision out of a three-panel person. So there are a lot of cases that deserve three people, but there are some that don't, and, uh, and even those complicated cases, a sole arbitrator could do them, but I think you'll get a, a higher quality uh, decision out of a three-person panel in, in complex cases. Short time limits within the proceedings also make sports arbitration streamlined. I take an example. Uh, the time granted for a challenge of an arbitrator appointment is seven days in, in the CAS and basketball arbitration, uh, 15 days under the Finnish rules, and 30 days uh, in the ICC arbitration. What is your view on challenges and their relation to the duration of the proceedings? <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm not sure that a lot of people in the audience will agree with me that are counsel for uh, parties, but uh, I think a, a lot of the challenges to arbitrators are uh, uh, tactical, uh, 
and not a desire for uh, justice and not a concern particularly about uh, bias or, or lack of being impartial. Um, now, certainly some of them are, and they're quite legitimate, and they should be, and, uh, and of course arbitrators should also be careful to make the proper disclosures about uh, whatever the background issues might be, connections with a party, uh, frequency of appearing in front of a particular council or for a particular uh, international federation, for example. Um, so those kinds of uh, uh, challenges are quite legitimate, but I, I also see a lot of times the uh, challenges are, are tactical, and I, I'm thinking now of one exit case that I'm involved in right at the moment, where every single p one, uh, person on the panel was challenged, every one of the challenges were lost, and I think we lost about seven months in terms of just getting that issue sorted out, it hadn't even started. Um, now that's an extreme situation, but uh, challenges uh, important part of the process, but there is some abuse, and I think that the short time frame, like uh, seven days or 30 days maximum, uh, is good. You should keep a challenge, uh, uh, and if people don't challenge within the time frame, then at least when you appeal this to the Swiss Federal Tribunal, uh, they won't let you do it later. If you haven't done it at the outset, uh, that's it. Uh, you chose the panel, you agreed to those party, uh, those persons doing the case, and uh, there won't be any appeal uh, from that uh, that will be successful. You mentioned, <coughs> you mentioned that in sports arbitration, the time limits are quite strictly followed. Uh, do you think that the tribunals on the commercial side are too careful with the parties' rights? Oh, well, everybody needs to be careful about parties' rights, the, the right to be heard and the, right, uh, and the obligation to stay within the scope of the arbitration uh, clause or provision or, or rule, depending on the circumstances. Um, and uh, the, the one grounds where you do see cases being overturned by the Swiss Federal Tribunal for caste cases uh, is in the area of uh, failing to uh, allow the parties to be heard. And, and one case I'm thinking of it was actually, I did the original CAS case, it went to the uh, um, appeal to CAS, I did the ten ITF, the International Tennis Federation case, and uh, some of the arguments were not addressed in the reasons, and uh, now in that case the Swiss Federal Tribunal said, oh, you haven't, given the, you haven't dealt with the party's right to be heard fully and you need to go back and reconsider it, which they did, and then they uh, ended up coming to the same conclusion as they had before, but they considered the other arguments which should have been in the written reasons but weren't at the time until after the Swiss Federal Tribunal appeal. So uh, um, uh, that's uh, um, one example of the right to be heard in sport. Uh, uh, I, I, I think it's important to pay close attention to jurisdiction. It's important to pay close attention to the right to be heard, and that doesn't matter whether it's a sports case or a commercial case. Um, but I think also uh, in the sports cases, there's a little less concern about, uh, not so much jurisdiction, because that's not very often is that an issue, uh, about the right to be heard. The right to be heard is, uh, is not in uh, terms of the procedure leading up to the arbitration, but at the arbitration procedure itself, uh, uh, where the errors occur, if they occur at all. Uh, under the CAS code, uh, the panel may render the operative part of the award prior to the reasoning. Now I have two questions. Uh, one, have you used this option yourself? And two, do you find this possibility useful? I have used the option. I sometimes think I shouldn't have after I have used it. Uh, I generally am opposed to it because I think as an arbitrator and all of those of you who are in the room that are arbitrators will recognize this as well. While you may leave many hearings thinking the results are going to be in a particular direction for one party and when you sit down and write the award it works out and that's exactly what happens. Uh, you do leave sometimes either not knowing that or uh, thinking that one side's going to win. And then when you sit down and you actually write it and try to make it all work out on paper, uh, you recognize that your initial reactions weren't as thoroughly thought out as you thought they were. And so the, uh, either the other side wins or there may be some other uh, middle ground that uh, you hadn't thought about at the time. And when you've issued the 
dispositive uh, in advance of putting the reasons together, I think uh, you expose the panel to a real problem because it becomes you can't change that dispositive, it's, it's locked in. Uh, and now you've got reasons that you may have to um, adjust to some extent to come to the conclusions that you already have announced, uh, even though you feel uncomfortable and perhaps uh, and not able to really justify that, but you don't have the chance to go back. So I'm generally opposed to putting out the uh, conclusions before a fully reasoned decision. But I recognize in rare occasions uh, it's needed and I'd go back to the Olympic Games ad hoc arbitration procedure. The example I used of Sydney, I, they had to have an answer the next morning. We didn't provide the reasons, I don't think, for a couple of days thereafter. But uh, um, the ripple effects require that uh, sometimes you have to put the dispositive out before you have the reasons. But, I'd be very reluctant to do it and I haven't had great experience with it and I have had the experience of writing decisions where I thought party A was going to win and ultimately when I wrote it out it didn't work that way and party B won or it, it, the, the whole outcome changed to some degree. The short time limits in, in sports arbitration obviously concern only the arbitration phase and what I think we increasingly see in commercial arbitration is that the parties start to litigate after the arbitration by, for example, challenging the awards. Have you seen this kind of a de development in, in sports arbitration? I have, and uh, here's the problem. In, in Particularly in international sports federations, some of their uh, rules will say something to the effect that uh, <clears throat> the decision won't be implemented until all paths of uh, appeal are exhausted <coughs> and uh, the CAS arbitration procedure uh, and the BAT arbitration procedure subject to the Swiss Federal Tribunal's jurisdiction and if you have that sort of uh, provision in your rules uh, you see international federations making an application to the Swiss Federal Tribunal for an appeal and uh, that whole decision is a tactic, uh, maybe directed by sports politics, a tactic that may be uh, just because there's some advantage in delaying longer. The, if it's affecting a particular individual, they may not be able to play in the upcoming season if it's delayed longer through uh, not being heard by the Swiss Federal Tribunal. Uh, and so uh, as a tactic, uh, appeals are uh, often brought uh, uh, when their rules are, it's the actual sanctions or whatever the conclusion of the decision is aren't applicable until after all appeals have been exhausted. And then you find those cases, of course, settling on the courtroom steps. They never actually proceed to be, uh, or usually don't proceed to a, uh, any kind of hearing before the tribun Swiss tribunal. Uh, they settle on the court steps uh, and then the full sanctions of the, of the decision kick in from there. Thank you. Um, I think it's time to move on to another topic, which is transparency. And so sports arbitration seems to be more transparent than commercial arbitration. For example, the, the CAS has an extensive database online, and we have it on the screen right now. As we can see, the CAS database reveals the details of a large number of past cases, including the names of the parties, the names of their counsel, and the, the names of the arbitrators. Also, a large number of awards is published on the CAS, CAS website. I think that the need for transparency has increased on the commercial side as well. So do you think, Richard, that, that commercial arbitration should follow the example of sports arbitration and really increase transparency? Well, I, I think where they can, yes. Uh, but one of the very foundational uh, functions of uh, commercial arbitration is confidentiality. It was mentioned in the earlier discussions today. And uh, <clears throat> many parties don't want to give that up. Uh, so transparency to what degree? Right? Well, you could maybe uh, name who the arbitrators are, uh, and uh, perhaps who the parties are, maybe even when the hearing is. Uh, but 
how useful is that information? I mean, it's useful in some respects. It's useful to counsel for future cases uh, if you know who the, uh, the arbitrators have been and, and, and what parties have been involved with that particular arbitrator. Um, but uh, I think in the commercial world, it, there's a real reluctance to move very far in, in that respect. And then, you know, CAS started off, as I said, it, it was born of commercial arbitration, that, uh, and now uh, we acquired, therefore, the notion of confidentiality in CAS cases. But when you think about sports law as a body, so like, let's take the doping rules, for example. All athletes that are involved in the Olympic system, and others as well, uh, pledge not to promise by contract not to take prohibited substances. And uh, in the in, in so doing, um, they um, are making uh, a promise that uh, is contractual in nature. And uh, if you apply a concept of con confidentiality, a sport administrator might want to know, well, why was that case with McLaren in it uh, only a six-month sanction? because they're trying to take the world anti-doping code and apply it to their sport. Uh, and so they need to have an understanding of the cases that went before. Now, while there's no binding precedent uh, procedure in uh, CAS or in sports arbitration, and there's, of course, not in commercial arbitration also, and if confidentiality is observed, you don't even know, unless you're on the inside, you don't know about the other cases. Uh, without... Uh, having a binding obligation to follow prior cases, I think it's important for the bodies that deal with doping cases and corruption cases like those in tennis and, and other situations that you know uh, why the uh, decision was made because the rules have to be administered across the board to many other circumstances than just the one that's at arbitration. And the only way that they can be f equitably handled and used is to know what's gone on before. So uh, uh, the nature of sport requires that uh, th that kind of disclosure occurs. So how does CAS solve it? Well, some of it you'll see by being on the screen here. Um, you can, through, while I find the website very difficult to use, I'm sure many of you who've tried to use it may find the same experience, and not all the cases are there, and some of the cases are edited, so they're not, it's not the entire reasons, which doesn't render them very useful in my view. Uh, it's, there is at least an attempt to provide a, a, a consistent body of jurisprudence that can be referenced to assist people in preparation for cases, but also to be used for the administration of doping rules, corruption rules, and, and other uh, rules across sport, uh, where sports administrators have to apply the rules and know what the thinking is of the arbitrators. So transparency is a little different in sport than it is in, in commercial arbitration. And I, I noticed, uh, I've been doing these anti-corruption matters for uh, professional tennis for about 10 years. and. Um, the Tennis Integrity Unit and the Professional Tennis Integrity Officers who are in charge were absolutely adamant that there should ever, never be a publication of reasons, uh, so no transparency. There would be a very brief press release saying McLaren had heard this case and provided, uh, imposed this sanction. And by the way, the sanctions can be very significant, up to a lifetime period of ineligibility and a fine of up to a quarter of a million US dollars. So, we're talking about very significant sanctions that can be applied. And um, gradually, they started to make those press releases more complete. And now they're, they're actually publishing the cases. We, I, and I think that's the right thing to do, because it, it, it acts as a deterrent to others if they're able to read what's going on. Uh, it also helps the, uh, everybody that's got cases that are processing them. Uh, to understand the thinking behind previous decisions and therefore maybe an approach to settling rather than arbitrating. Uh, and it, of course, it helps the sports administrators apply their own rules in other situations. So transparency in sport uh, is important and, um, and everybody's moving more and more in that direction. Even CAS is publishing far more cases than they ever used to, um, but they're still not entirely complete. They hold some back. Uh, contrast the basketball arbitration tribunal or MGSS, McLaren Global Sports Solution cases with the uh, USC uh, martial, mixed martial arts. Uh, 
all the decisions are available. They're all online and they're all available to anybody who wants to see them and review them. And I think that's a, a, a very important positive step. So uh, transparency has quite a different set of issues uh, in the sports world than it does in the commercial world. Have you experienced that the parties would definitely want to have their names concealed in, in sports arbitration? And what would be the reasons? Frequently, uh, parties want their names concealed. Uh, and uh, um, oftentimes, when it's athletes and they're doping or uh, corruption matters like wagering on uh, matches and things, they don't want their parents to know. Or they don't want the tennis club uh, that has uh, provided funding for them to be a uh, competitor. They, uh, so uh, those kind of reasons uh, are uh, ones that I wouldn't consider legitimate. Uh, uh, they, they should be published, but there are uh, occasions when it's not appropriate, particularly uh, when you're dealing with, a, in basketball arbitration, frequently a player is dismissed from a club because they failed, let's say, to disclose a knee injury that they had several years ago. It's now causing problems and players uh, on medical leave and should have disclosed it at the time of being transferred or hired and didn't. And so you end up uh, with a lot of very personal medical information, uh, which uh, I don't think should be published. So. Uh, um, there can be good and bad reasons for uh, concealing what's going on or who the parties are. Uh, um, as long as the reasons are solid, I don't have any problem with redacting information, but the overall structure of the decision should be available to the public. I, I jump <clears throat> to, to costs of uh, sports arbitration. And so could you first please explain briefly that uh, how are the fees of the CAS arbitrators uh, ordered? Uh, I can explain it generally, but not particularly, because it's really not known. But the, there's an hourly, a fixed hourly rate. Uh, arbitrators submit their time, and the typical model uh, it would, if it's a three-person panel, uh, the cast would expect that a, a co-arbitrator would have something in the vicinity of 45 hours uh, of a case. Now, more complex, longer, less complex, shorter, of course. This is just a rule of thumb. And the president, the party person writing the decision would have more like 60 hours. Uh, and then, um, but even there, uh, the secretary general feels uh, on occasion, or more than perhaps on occasion, quite frequently, intervenes to reduce the time uh, and has the authority to do that under the different CAS rules. Um, so uh, there is a time, you need to control the time. Uh, I find in the Basketball Arbitration Tribunal, uh, what we've done is uh, we've controlled the costs uh, of the arbitrators. Uh, I have jurisdiction to do the same thing as uh, what happened with the Secretary General at CAS and, and reduce the hours. Um, and then on the other side, uh, what's the party's cost? What costs should they be able to recover? And um, I found in the basketball arbitration situation, the arbitrators were having a lot of problems with determining costs. So you had the, the, the English tradition, uh, the, the costs follow the event, so if one party wins, then pretty much full cost to that party may be reduced to some extent. Um, and uh, so you have the cast rule, it's a, a contribution to uh, costs, I think is the language they use in the rules in 63 or 4. Um, and we have similar language, but to help the arbitrators more in, in the BAT system, what we did is we said costs can't exceed a, a certain dollar levels, uh, the costs can't exceed that ceiling, and the maximum ceiling for any case, no matter what, I suppose there's always the possibility of somebody coming to me and saying, Mr. President, would I be able to charge more in this particular case for these reasons? But uh, the cost is capped at 40,000 euros, uh, but that would be for a very big multi-million dollar uh, case, of which we have five, five or six a year. Um, and the lower the scale, the more the, the cost goes down, of course, and you can't exceed the cap. And that makes it a lot easier for the decision makers because they can simply say, don't have to uh, determine what the contribution should be. It's just that we'll give you the maximum or we'll give you 
less than the maximum depending on what went on. And so that simplified the cost procedure. And I, I find with CAS proceedings, the cost uh, procedure is uh, not understood by the arbitrators uh, and by the secretariat. And um, so there's some very unusual cost rulings uh, that go on there that I think we avoided that by the way we approach the problem. I think we'll move on to the, to the final uh, topic, which is the rosters of arbitrators. Um, a closed list of arbitrators is, is very common in sports arbitration. For example, in the CAS, in the UFC, and the, in the basketball arbitration, they, they all have closed list of arbitrators. Could you first please explain how the, the lists are, are constituted? Well, in all those cases, uh, whether it's CAS or BAT or... Um uh, UFC or uh, uh, many others, you make an application and somebody reviews it and makes a decision. In the CAS case, uh, it goes to the ICAS, which is the body that oversees and governs the Court of Arbitration for Sport. And uh, so the, the closed list, what they're looking for, I think, are a number of things. They're looking for uh, gender and geographical uh, diversity experience with litigation matters, uh, particularly with the uh, use of evidence and the admissibility of evidence, not in the context of a specific set of uh, domestic rules, but in the international process. Um, and one of the big advantages of arbitration is uh, the people who are the decision makers can have specialized knowledge, which in the national court systems, you usually have to educate the judge about uh, the problem. So if it's a construction problem, you have to maybe put in considerable expert evidence to uh, have the uh, understanding uh, that's necessary to really evaluate the evidence. Whereas you could have an engineer uh, on the arbitration panel who could uh, understand that and assist others. Uh, uh, so there's a, a real advantage to having a closed arbitration lists where you want people with specific uh, knowledge, and, uh, and that's primarily the reason for the closed lists. Uh, now, National Hockey League salary arbitration, uh, you wouldn't want to have an arbitrator there who knew nothing about ice hockey and had only played perhaps field hockey or not, no hockey whatsoever. Um, so that kind of knowledge of the game, knowledge of the sport is of some assistance in, in Particularly so when you have to make speedy decisions, like at the ad hoc decisions uh, divisions at uh, the Olympic Games. So, um, I know people who would like to be on the list and aren't consider that closed lists are uh, simply a, a barrier to overcome and and blocks them from what they want to do, which is be a sports arbitrator. As long as you have confidence that the administrators that make those decisions about people who apply are doing so uh, equitably and fairly and with respect to objective criteria to the extent that they can because um, many of those measurements are subjective uh, experience and skill and so, so forth. Um, I think the closed list is necessary a lot of times in sport and perhaps less so in the commercial arbitration world, uh, although they also have closed lists in many of those systems as well. Do you, do you think that the closed close list limits the party's right to nominate an arbitrator? Well, it does in a way, and it doesn't. Uh, let me give you an example of how you can get around that. Uh, when I was put uh, on the National Hockey League salary arbitration list, what they did is they took... Now, there's, there's only two parties. There's the union, Players Association, and then there's the league. And so each side put together eight names. Uh, I was on the league's list, and the Players Association put eight names together. They exchanged their lists, and they gave each side the right to cu uh, cut four people off so that the ultimate final list was eight. Uh, I managed to survive the cut, so I became a salary arbitrator for the National Hockey League. Uh, and uh, so the, the parties had input in that way. And it, it, it's not direct, because then they have no input as to the particular arbitrator in the particular case but they have some confidence in the people that they've approved uh, are, uh, and are on the panel. So there are various ways of, of dealing with that uh, and still have a, a, a closed list. Um, it's not beyond our creativity as lawyers to uh, deal with those kinds of problems without changing the fundamental foundation that, that the people there need to have real experience. <laughs> 
there, <coughs> there are a couple of arbitration institutes who have open lists on the commercial side, uh, Singapore and Vienna, for example. Do you think that a closed list would be something that the commercial side should think of? I uh, don't have a lot of experience with either of those two particular arbitration institutes, although I've been, I've done some cases using the rules of Singapore. Um, uh, if it works uh, for particular areas of the world or particular institutions, I don't see any reason that you need to move from an open list to a closed list, but um, uh, I, I still don't think uh, open lists are particularly uh, well suited to the sports arbitration world on the whole. I think that uh, the time is running out now and uh, we will conclude the interview. So thank you, Richard, for your valuable insights. Uh, if, there, if there is any, any time for a couple of questions from the floor, then uh, we could have maybe just one or two. We've bored everyone. <laughs> Thank you very much, Pekka from Aplex Attorneys here in Helsinki. I've practiced for quite a while in uh, sports arbitration and uh, my question is one of the aspects I find a bit more peculiar in sports law that is applicable law and that, that was not touched upon here. Now, the CAS code expressly provides in the appeal proceeding that the applicable rules are the rules of the sports federation which uh, the decision of which is appealed and the bat actually goes uh, decisions are by default ex equat bono right. now that makes uh, things uh, arguably a lot simpler of course you don't need to make submissions regarding applicable law and it's a system that's very much limited and familiar arguably it also protects the award to a certain extent it might be a bit more difficult to attack an award that's rendered under ex equat bono but my question is, do you, do you see this being applied also in commercial arbitration to some extent? And do you find this a relevant aspect of sports law and what makes it more efficient? Well, the ex equio bono uh, in terms of the basketball arbitration is done for a very practical reason. It has nothing to do with what you said. It has to do with the fact that uh, <clears throat> if, if you... First of all, many countries in Europe you can't arbitrate employment disputes, which is what these, many of these disputes are in that. Uh, it's about payment, uh, salary. Uh, and so, but you can in Switzerland, so the seat of arbitration is in Switzerland. And um, if you had to apply the, if the applicable law was, let's say, the uh, one, a Western European country, then in order to make the decision, you'd have to receive expert uh, reports from uh, reputable, well-known experts uh, about what the law was in that particular jurisdiction and, and put them in front of the arbitrator and that would considerably slow down and impede the process when really what you need is an interpretation of a contract that, uh, and doing so in a way which is equitable and, and appropriate, fair in accordance with natural justice. So that's, that's a foundational uh, point in, in basketball arbitration that it be ex equio bono. And of course, the, the jurisdiction to do that is also available commercially, but uh, I don't think it happens very often, not that I'm aware of anyway. Um, so applicable law in other circumstances is, uh, can be problematic because you, um, you have the, the institute being in Switzerland, for example, in, the case, uh, in Cass's case, but the parties can uh, determine uh, that the law of a particular country can apply, but the procedural law is that of Switzerland. And if the parties haven't de designated uh, applicable law, then the default is Swiss law. And um, in the tennis cases, uh, the default is law in Florida. Um, and, and that's a problem area. That's a problem area in commercial law. It's also a problem area in sport. But uh, a very good way out of that is ex aequia bono. And uh, it's there for the reasons that I explained, not, not really to uh, ensure that there are less appeals or um, attack on the integrity of the process and the, and the decision. Yes, sir. Hannu Kalkas. Uh, yeah, I work for, as counsel for several athletes in, in uh, CAS. And just a, more of a comment. You discussed about the 
role of the, of the arbitration institute. And the CAS, as we know, is creating Lex Sportiva, and therefore uh, the decisions are considered uh, pre-judicates, uh, pre and, uh, and some of them are published. But, uh, and therefore also the Arbitration Institute, the CAS, works uh, actively, both for the arbitrators and for the councils. But uh, as long as uh, Finnish Chamber of Commerce Arbitration Institute is not trying to create a new Lex Mercatoria or something like that, so I don't think that is the, there's no reason to Arbitration Institute to be active. Well, I, I agree with you. I don't think there is a reason necessarily for commercial arbitration uh, decisions to be um, available to parties. Uh, and I understand the cornerstone is confidentiality, so uh, that's a reason not to make the decisions available. And when you talk about Lex Sportiva, uh, I guess that's still under debate as to the, the extent to which it really is there and, and to the extent to which it's evolving. But you do need to have uh, some publication of those decisions because, as I pointed out, quite apart from resolving the party's dispute, uh, so you decide somebody's innocent or they've committed a doping infraction or whatever the decision may be, uh, the, the rules in sport need to be applied in all other circumstances quite apart from the parties. That's somewhat unique to sport compared to two companies in a commercial matter having a dispute over, let's say, a contract of sale and uh, the proper description of uh, goods sold or whatever the issue might be. Uh, uh, there isn't necessary to go back and look at the detail of that case in, in some other circumstance, but there would be in the case of, uh, for example, my impo imposing on a tennis player a lifetime ban from ever competing in the sport because I've taken away his major method of, uh, uh, for living and earning a living. Um, uh, his livelihood is, is taken away from that decision. So. Um, I think those ought to be available so that one, other players know the risks, but two, uh, the sports administrators can apply the rules fairly in other circumstances. And um, so I, I, I'm fully accept commercial arbitration doesn't need to necessarily publish its decisions, but uh, I think sports does. And, and in the course of doing so, you have Lex Sportiva. What I don't uh, th agree with and sometimes it's happening is people following the decisions and prior decisions. I think uh, to be a, develop a consistent body of jurisprudence you need to refer to the prior decisions um, but you shouldn't do that uh, uh, slavishly following whatever happened and those should happen in this case uh, because it should be uh, individually determined uh, and so um, the, at best, you look to it not to follow the decision, but to understand the thinking in a prior case and see its application, if at all, to the case you're handling. Okay, thank you, Richard. I think we have to conclude here. Okay. Thank you. Good. Thank you. That's good.